So I wanted to try something new on the channel this week, which is to make a recap of my most recent event, the Indianapolis Eight Hour. In the past, I've been doing some vlogs and I know people really like the vlogs, but I find that when I'm vlogging at a race, I don't really pay attention to doing a vlog. I tend to forget to shoot things because I'm busy working. And this way, it really allows me to just have a B-roll camera rolling and then talk about how the event went. It also gives me more time to think about certain things and maybe form an opinion differently as I look back a couple days after the event. So let me know what you think of this format and hopefully you enjoy it. But let's dive in to the Indianapolis eight hour. The Indianapolis eight hour is the fourth round of the Intercontinental GT Challenge, but also the finale race of SRO's GT World Challenge America. That means there was an eclectic mix of cars on track and a lot of classes to keep track of. The event was only GT3 cars, but we had a lot of manufacturers represented. We had Porsche, BMW, Acura, Ferrari, Aston Martin, and Mercedes AMG. There were 22 cars in total, which is not a lot compared to some of the other major GT3 races in the world, but it was still enough cars to give us a good race. Before I continue, I wanna take a brief moment to mention Lockdown Brand. Their Icon LD snapbacks, which you'll see me wearing in a lot of my videos, like this one right now, they are literally the best hats I've ever worn. Water just beads off of them, and when it's time for a wash, you just throw them in the washing machine, hang them to dry, and they're dry in a few hours. Lockdown Brand is based in Australia, and they make lifestyle clothing with motorsport in mind, so it becomes the perfect stuff to wear to the racetrack. If you want to pick up some gear yourself, visit the link in the description below and use my code MARK10 to get 10% off your order. I will say Lockdown Brand is not a sponsor of this video, but I do get a small commission if you use my code. The track was of course the Indianapolis Motor Speedway, but the road course configuration. I'll preface this by saying it's definitely not my favorite circuit to shoot. I actually think it's one of my least favorite circuits to shoot. It's a 14 turn oval road course hybrid that measures at just under five kilometers. And I can confirm this, I have run the track a few times, as you can see on my Strava right there. And it's a great track for running because it's completely flat which doesn't make it that great of a track for racing, unfortunately. There's no elevation and the cars don't really take any curbs or anything aggressively, so it just kind of ends up being a bit bland. Also, fun fact about this circuit, unlike most roval style circuits, this one actually goes the opposite direction of the oval. So turn one for the road course is the oval's turn four and the cars go the opposite way down the front stretch than when you see the Indy 500. In terms of shooting locations, there aren't a lot of red zones at the Indy Road Course. And if you're new here, a red zone is basically somewhere trackside that we're not allowed to go to for safety reasons. And they'll be marked red on the map. And sometimes they're actually marked in red on the ground at places like Paul Ricard or at Le Mans. However, it is a really large circuit and that presents a lot of challenges if you're walking. Like many US circuits, there weren't any media shuttles uh, to take us around. So there was no one to drive you to the different turns or anything like that. You were relying on your own transportation. So if you're walking, you're at a disadvantage. Some people rented uh, golf carts, but that can get quite expensive. Or you can have your own like scooter or e-bike. And this was made even more important by the backstretch crossover bridge being closed. That meant that the short walk from the media center became a 10 to 15 minute golf cart ride underneath the circuit twice and all the way through Brickyard Crossing Golf Course. So that was a bit of a headache. The race runs from 12.15 p.m. to 8.15 p.m., which meant that we were gonna run through sunset, which is always amazing for videographers like myself because we love a good golden hour. And stay tuned to see that Indianapolis Motor Speedway's golden hour truly delivered. I was at the Indy 8 Hour shooting for BMW Motorsport through an agency that handles those social media accounts. So that meant that I had four cars to shoot, two from Belgian powerhouse team WRT, and they were both uh, BMW factory entries, and then uh, two cars that are full-time GT World Challenge America cars from Samantha Tan Racing and Bimmer World. I also shot some of the support series like GT4 and TC America because there were BMWs competing in those as well. My gear for this race was pretty standard. I had two camera bodies with me, the FX6 and the A7S III. And yes, I just told you which camera bodies I was using. I don't normally do that. It's something that I've kind of been at odds with doing. And you know, should I talk about camera brands even though I'm not sponsored or anything like that? And I'm finding that it's just more of a benefit to the people that are following because they're just interested in knowing which cameras you were using. And it can give you a better idea 
of how I was capturing my content. So those were the two camera bodies that I was using. For lenses, I was using the Sigma 24 to 70 f2.8, as well as their 50 millimeter 1.4, and I had a 100 to 400 f4.8 to 5.6. I was running just a simple shotgun mic for audio connected via XLR into the FX6. And I also had a simple gimbal and a tripod with me, although I never actually used the tripod. It just sat in my bag. Really glad that I packed that. I find I'm using my tripod less and less, but at least it's getting some use right now to hold the camera for this video. I should specifically mention filters. I've been using Nisi filters pretty exclusively. I used their variable ND one to five stops on the A7S III because it doesn't have built-in ND filters. And then I did occasionally use a polarizer, but I used pretty extensively their one eighth black mist filter. I even broke the brand new 77 millimeter that I had purchased that week before I'd even really had a chance to use it, and I already bought a replacement. Don't put in warranty claims for damage that you clearly did. I broke that filter, I'm not gonna ask them for a new one, I just went out and bought a new one. So getting into the race day itself, I got to the track around 8 a.m. after having a solid breakfast at Charlie Brown's in Speedway. If you're ever in Indy for a race, get to Charlie Brown's. It's an amazing breakfast joint that is full of racing memorabilia. It's very affordable and it's just an awesome place to have breakfast, have a coffee and just see some old memorabilia and really just drink in the local racing culture in Indianapolis. I shot a few laps of the TC America race at 8.30 and I managed to get an awesome shot of all five BMWs running together and I was very happy with that. Shortly after it was time for the autograph session, I went down to the autograph session and did some shooting, but I didn't really end up using much of it. It also backed directly on to the pre-race grid, so a bunch of the drivers had to miss it to do the recon lap and drive their car to the grid. Speaking of the grid, the grid walk was absolutely packed and fortunately it went on for a really long time. A lot of grid walks like in GT World Challenge Europe, for example, you might have five minutes by the time your car gets there and parked before you have to go down to the turn one for the start. Here, all the cars were parked well in advance. There was no shuffling cars to the grid through people. They let the fans on, there was a band, and it was just a really cool experience. The grid is also a great opportunity just to get shots of the full crew and the drivers wishing each other luck, high-fiving, fist bumping, that kind of thing. It really helps just to show the camaraderie and the emotions before a big race. For the start, I elected to go to the inside of the speedway or driver's right just past turn one. The classic start shot at Indy is outside of turn one showing the cavernous speedway and the cars kind of rumbling towards the first turn, but I find for video it can be a bit boring. So I went somewhere where I could be closer to the cars. I managed to get a great shot of Philip Ang in the sixth car making his pass for the lead. He actually went from fourth to first due to just a superb start. I also elected to shoot the start at 120 frames per second. Normally, I will do starts at a regular you know, speed frame rate, like 24, but in Indy, there's a good chance of carnage in the tight turn one. So I went for a high frame rate just to capture that. But of course we ended up having a clean start. Since I nailed the start shot, I wanted to send my agency contact uh, the shot to post it right away. So Emma and I headed back to the media center. Emma is WRT's press officer who kindly offered use of the team's golf cart and even came trackside with me to get some content. And it was her first experience doing that. And she had a great time. Once I clipped the start and sent it off, we went back out for a few hours of shooting. I did some panning through fans on the turn one mound, and I went to this really cool spot outside of turn one. It required some climbing under the fence, but that's no big deal. And you're probably wondering why I'm wearing a race suit here. Uh, it's because I have to wear that suit when I'm shooting in the pit lane, and I don't like to go back to the media center and change. So I wear it all day just in case something happens and I need to rush to the pit lane quick. Plus it was chilly, and that way I didn't need to wear a jacket. We finished up a stint trackside shooting in the short shoot between turns one and two. Then we headed back to the media center to do a bit of editing and my lovely wife who came with me to the race weekend brought me McDonald's for lunch. I had a 10 piece McNugget meal with fries because I have the meal preferences of a small child. And it was great that Nicole came with me on this trip. Indianapolis is about a seven hour drive from our home and she made the drive down on Friday to essentially see me for one day on Saturday and then we drove back together on Sunday. I'm gone a lot for work and I'm currently in the span of seven straight weekends. So getting to see her for a little bit on a race weekend was a huge bonus. After lunch and some editing, I made a quick pit stop to join Ash on her watch along stream. 
I've known Ash for a few years and she is one of the hardest working women in motorsports. She's a Twitch streamer and content creator and she works with SRO at a lot of their races in the US. She also works with Red Bull Racing and a bunch of other entities and she's just absolutely incredible. So it was great to join her and take questions about my job from the chat. If you wanna see more of Ash's content, check out her Twitch account, which is linked in the description below. Then I got suited back up and spent a few hours in the pit lane. For this event, we of course used the US NASCAR style pit lane. This means the teams had to contend with a wall to jump over. The US based teams are used to this, but the European teams like WRT rarely experience this and they're much more used to the European style pit lanes that have garages. The light was starting to get nice and I managed to get a pit stop each for all four BMWs. I did a few with the gimbal and a few handheld to get some variety. I also mixed the frame rates up between 120 frames per second and 24 frames per second so I could have some slow motion and some regular speed. I also ran into Brenton Grove, who was in Indy competing with his father and Earl Bamber in their Grove racing entry. This meant he was missing the Bathurst 1000 back in Australia where the Groves run Penrite Racing. He said it was weird to not be there and it would be mixed emotion if they won at Bathurst. He'd of course be happy, but also gutted that he wasn't there to witness it in person. I've worked with Brenton in the past, so it's always great to run into him and have a quick chat. Now that we're about halfway through the video, it's quite clear that you're enjoying yourself. So why not hit the subscribe button? It's free and it helps me a lot. I always feel like it's so cringe to ask people to do that. The light in pit late at this time was pretty solid and combined with that 1.8 black mist filter, I was able to get some shots that I'm really happy with. If you're unfamiliar with mist filters, they basically soften an image. They make highlights a bit less pronounced and they lower the overall contrast in your image. It kind of mimics the look of like vintage lenses, if you know what I mean. Like maybe not, but that's kind of the vibe I get from it. The stronger the mist filter, the more this effect is applied. It can be easily overdone, but I've used it a few times this year, uh, both at golden hour and in the pit lane at night, and I've been pretty happy with the results. I should say I didn't use the mist filter on any trackside shots. I tried that in Dubai earlier this year and I found that anytime you were shooting through a fence, it made the haze of the fence way worse. Following that stint in pit lane, golden hour was starting to hit. So Emma and I hopped in the golf cart and went to the backside of the circuit. In Indy, the sun rises over the backstretch and sets over the front stretch. A great way to figure out where the sun is going to be is by using an app or a website like SunCalc. Now we use this a lot to get an idea of where the sun will be in the sky and we can plan our shots for each session accordingly. I decided that I wanted to put all my money on backlit shots. This means the sun is behind the cars and it creates a silhouette, which I love. We started outside turn seven and eight, which as you can see here, it was pretty fruitful. We also stopped just outside of turn four and I was able to get this shot in the gap between the barrier and fence. I absolutely love this and I didn't see anyone else with a shot like this. So I was very happy I was able to capture this. And I did actually post one on my Instagram as a reel. I've been trying the 16 by nine flip sideways. I don't know, let me know what you think. Go to my Instagram, leave a comment. If you don't like it, I don't really care. I'm gonna keep doing it. We decided to finish up golden hour outside of turn one and two where I shot the race start. And this pretty much speaks for itself. <laughs> Don't really have to say much. The sunsets at this time of year in Indianapolis are absolutely insane. This is some of the best light I've ever captured on camera. And yeah, very happy with that. This light is just, this light is just absolutely bonkers. Like you could put anyone out there and they would get Great stuff. Emma needed to head back to the media center, so I just had her drop me off outside of turn 14. I climbed a lot of stairs to get some shots from above. I got some great shots from up there, one of which I used in my final recap edit. I also stopped on the ground level to shoot the cars coming onto the front stretch, which is probably one of my favorite spots on this circuit. It's pretty breathtaking and you get a really cool shot as the cars come back onto the front stretch. And this ended up being the final on-track shot in my post-race recap video. Honestly, after that, it was pretty much just time to wait around for the checkered flag. I'm at 12,800 ISO. <laughs> Team WRT's sixth sponsored BMW M4 GT3 took the win. And unfortunately, the team wasn't able to go to the wall for the celebration as they were originally told not to by the officials. Emma, are you gonna go to the wall? Yeah, I think okay. so. Yeah, yeah, they're gonna go. Then by the time they convinced the official, it was too late. 
but I still managed to get some solid celebration shots with the fireworks in the background. Park Ferme was also fantastic as Sheldon Vandelinda got up on the roof of the car to celebrate, which was really cool. It's times like this I find where my experience really pays off. I knew that once he was finished his initial celebration, he was gonna go looking for his teammates. So I followed him and I got that initial embrace. This is a really important shot for the storytelling of the event. Racing is a team sport and they win and lose together. The podium was just okay. Uh, in hindsight, I probably would have gone up high to the right where there's a place where you can stand and just shot it from up there to get something different, but I only used a little bit of this anyway, so it wasn't that big a deal. After the podium, we of course had to get the drivers kissing the bricks. It's an Indianapolis tradition. The start finish line is actually paved with bricks one yard wide. In fact, the whole track was originally paved with bricks, but these are the only ones that are remaining. NASCAR champion Dale Jarrett actually started this tradition in 1996. After he won the Brickyard 400, he and his crew chief Todd Parrott went out and decided, hey, let's kiss the bricks on the front straightaway. And now pretty much everyone that wins a race at Indy kisses the bricks. After another quick winner's shoot with the car and the full team, we headed back to the media center to start the slog of editing. But first I had to order pizza from Brozini's in Speedway. This is a tradition that Bob Chapman started back in 2021. There's no food provided to the media at this race, so Bob decided that he would just order pizza for everybody. And the last couple of years, I've spearheaded ordering the pizza. We basically just all go in on it, divide up the cost, and everyone pays. I think it was like eight bucks this year each, and we all got to eat pizza. So it was fantastic if you're in Speedway, Brozini's. It's amazing New York style pizza and it is American portions. The slices are massive. Like, if you're from Europe, it's gonna blow your mind. As late night edits go, this one actually wasn't that bad. I was editing a single recap to be used by BMW and Sixth on Instagram, and it was just edited to a trending audio track that I suggested. We're finding engagement to be a lot higher with trending audio rather than just a traditional like stock song from Musicbed or something like that. Uh, so I can't play the audio here for you because it is like a licensed track, but if you want to watch the video with audio, you can go to the BMW Motorsport account and watch the vertical version, or you can go to my Instagram account and watch the full 16 by 9 version. I was wrapped by just after midnight, and we headed back to the hotel. So that was my day shooting the Indianapolis 8-hour. As working days go at the racetrack, it was a 16-hour day, and I'd give it... I'd give it a nine out of 10. Not my favorite circuit, but overall deliverables were not super difficult. I managed to get some great shots I was really happy with, and I had some great company. I was working with great people, and I just really enjoyed being there. So I actually had a really good time. I was dreading going to Indy. I was just there a few weeks ago, and like I said, not my favorite circuit, but I actually really enjoyed myself on what ended up actually being five days in total. I just took you through the race day, but I actually got to Indy on Tuesday. But you know what? I enjoyed myself, nine out of 10. I wanna say a big thanks to Emma from WRT who offered the use of their golf cart and even drove me around and was great company in the media center. It's always great to hang out with her and make jokes and have a great time. We've known each other for a few years. I also wanna say thanks to Nicole and Hope for going to pick up the pizza and bring it to us, which was amazing. So I could start editing and I didn't have to go get the pizza. And I also just wanna say a big thanks to all of you for watching this video. Really appreciate it. Let me know what you think of the format. Like I said at the beginning, I think I prefer this to doing a proper vlog, but let me know what you think in the comments below. Also, if you have any questions about working as a motorsport videographer, please leave them below as well. I'm shortly going to do a part two of my most asked questions. If you wanna watch part one, you can do so down in the description below. In fact, it might even just be on screen right now as this video ends. And uh, yeah, I just answer the questions people always ask me, which is great because now I just send people to that video and I just don't answer the questions. It's fantastic. I'll end by saying that I'm privileged to have the best job in the world and I love sharing it with you. We'll see you in the next one.